remember the first Robin Thicke music video. He had the long hair with no shirt, and he's like riding through New York City, and he's da 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 da, and he's like mm-hmm. doing his thing. Yeah. And that was me. I was on the flow. It was end of day two, toward the end of day two, and I'm like, I got this, and I'm mm-hmm. coming down with my little backpack, turn the curb, and I got skipped like a rock. You would have thought Thanos was real and picked me up and just skipped me down Second Avenue, like uh, about thirty feet. And that's when I said I'm done with that. So I, I was all over. I was doing all these things. And, and I think for me, in terms of just how you get over over that ad- adversity and how you got out of it on the other side, I think sometimes it's just sheer will. Welcome to Career Cheat Code. In this podcast, you'll hear how everyday people impact the world through their careers. Learn about their journey, career hacks, and obstacles along the way. Whether you're already having the impact you want or are searching for it, this is the podcast for you. Ian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, brother. Appreciate you having me here, Ratty. Real excited, yeah. real excited. About time. Have me waiting. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. You and I have had this conversation about about this uh, interview for a while, so I'm just glad that it's coming together at this point. Let's dive right in, man. Let's tell the world what it is you do for a living. Yeah, so I'm Chief Program Officer at Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation here in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. Been in the role, uh, pretty new now to it. Been in the role for about six weeks now, but um, essentially I'm overseeing all of their programmatic work to drive uh, economic impact to the central Brooklyn community, um, all toward disrupting the racial wealth gap. Got it. Is this what you always wanted to do for a living? Growing up, no, no, uh, it wasn't. I spent a lot of time like vacillating between what I wanted to do and, and figuring that out. You know, at one point, you know, I wanted to be a professional athlete. You know, I was big into baseball growing up as a kid. And then um, I, I got into the practice and, and uh, watching that TV show for some reason put a habit into me of wanting to always be right with people as a kid. And I really liked having a good debate about stuff. So I wanted to be a lawyer and kind of stuck with that. But my journey, you know, as life does, as life goes, right, you go in so many different unpredictable directions. You think you know what's coming, but we, we don't. We just don't. So uh, it led me here to where I'm at now. Got it. All right. So let's backtrack. Where'd you grow yeah. up? Where were you born? Uh, what was your upbringing like? Uh, I grew up in Jersey, uh, northern New Jersey, uh, in a town called Hackensack. For those that are familiar, don't hold it for or against me. Um, I was born in L.A., though, uh, to a single mother. Uh, and a, I have a little brother um, as well. But uh, we moved from L.A. when I was three. She had 85 cents in her pocket, uh, me in a stroller and my brother in a belly. And wow. um, we had nowhere to go. We were lucky enough to be taken in by a family, just a caring family. Um, and um, as a kid, all I knew was that we were in these folks' homes. They were not blood relatives, but they were family. And I lived there up until I was about 10 years old. And I saw my mother during that time put herself through school at the local community college. Sorry, not Bergen, Passaic County Community College. She ultimately mm-hmm. ended up teaching at Bergen County Community College uh, for respiratory therapy and then saw her work. Uh, no less than two to three jobs at any given time. In fact, my entire life, she's always had two jobs. Mm. When she was working at the hospital, she would always she would also teach part time as well. And so I saw my mother do things all the way from house cleaning to photography and being like background and lighting for for that kind of stuff. And I was with her to see that because she had no one to watch us, uh, me and my little brother when we were uh, little all the time. So. I got to see firsthand, you know, what hard work looked like, what hustle looked like, what it means to say you want to go for something and really not necessarily know how you're going to go about doing it. But Mm -hmm. just having faith and belief, you know, and your strengths and and your ability to just just get it done to make it happen. And uh, that was very contagious for me. But, yeah, that's that's where I grew up on the first part of my you know years as a young uh, young kid. Uh, at 10, I moved over to Hackensack from Teaneck, New Jersey, and that's where I started to form the relationships that, you know, I, I built throughout my childhood and that I have now, uh, even to this day. And it was really there as a kid. I remember at 10, we were moving and I thought, I said to my mother, you know, the kids in Hackensack coming from Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, the, you know, the kids in Hackensack, you know, they they got their stuff together. You know, they they look like grown adults. They I, we're all scared of them because they were big and tough and good at football. We, I just thought at 10, I was supposed to be paying rent or something if we're moving to this new place, <laughs> right? And I think looking back on it, my subconscious was I was definitely connecting with what I had, what I was observing, right? As a kid with my mom, working these multiple jobs, trying to put herself through school, staying up all day, all night, and then ultimately moving over to the night shift when she finished school for about 10, 
11 years while still showing up to all our baseball games and our track meets and everything like that. And so in Hackensack, it was really where I got to see because I was of an age to be able to process these things. All the things she was trying to balance, it was very, um, uh, most would say aspirational, others might say aggressive, but if it were not for that, that, I don't think I'd be here where I am today. Absolutely. I mean, those are the early age formative years that bring your perspective in life, right? That just kind of let me know what that hard work looks like. Seeing a single mother, a few questions there. One, how much older are you than your, than your younger brother? And then two, as you're seeing this unfold, right, and you're kind of of high school age. Talk to me about what kind of student you were at that time and mm-hmm. what you thought you were going to be able to like do in life at that point. Yeah. Uh, well, my brother, my younger brother, he's four and a half years um, younger than me in high school in terms of, I'm oh, sorry, it was a question, just what, I'm, what I want to do, what I wanted to do yeah, when I was in high I, school. You know, and I think part of it, right, because you mentioned like you wanted like basically pay rent at that age, right? And I think no, yeah, that, yeah, no, that sure. comes with like seeing your parents kind of struggle and go through it and feeling like you need to be much more grown than you are at that age when at the age you really just needed to go playing hide and seek right <laughs> or whatever right but <laughs> yeah. you know i think in in some ways like and i parallel this a lot to my story about like my mother is a single parent immigrant that came to this country same thing right with no niggles in her pocket and trying to figure things out and then yeah. you get here and similarly she found interesting that you said you know kind of like this extended family but she found like a human that just took care of her while she was here, um, while she kind of set up her life from sleeping on a couch to then sleeping in a room to then getting her own apartment and then getting me to come to this country, right? So, like, I understand, uh, like, seeing someone kind of go through that and what that does for you at an early perspective. At an early age, you're like, okay, this is what I need to do. I need to make sure she's fine. I need to make sure we get in a better situation. So I'm just wondering what you were thinking that outlet was for you at that age I mean, if it was sports if it was something else that you were like you know what i, I want to be able to like to do something oh yeah uh, for me um for me a lot of my childhood I, I heard the phrase you know when it's your money you have a job you can get it uh so that was you know i look i may look young but i'm old enough to remember what it's like to have to call collect and always make sure you have 25 and then it went up to 35 cents in your pocket to be able to make a call for you and ha- you know to to be able to talk to folks and that was even in the early days of people starting to get phones and pagers and beepers mm-hmm. uh, so for me like my my outlet was again going back to just all right if i need to make money then the first thing i want to do is make money how can i do that you know outside of allowance or whatever and when i found out i can get working papers at 14 at the time that was what started it all off and so in addition to my mother was around 14 where um, another really important, prominent figure came into my life. His name is Andre Reese, but I, I call him Pop. Um, at the mm. time, uh, I found myself getting caught up, being a teenager, partying, drinking, and I um, got caught up one evening. And my mother found out, got grounded for a few months, and I was introduced to Andre Reese, a, a teen addiction counselor, and um, we developed a, a really tight knit relationship in the first few years of knowing each other, and we just that let that blossom. And it grew to something way more. And by the time I was in college, you know, he felt like a father figure to me. I felt like a son figure to him. And so at 14, he was just my my counselor at the time. And he knew I was looking for work and I would always complain about the things I want, but want, but couldn't get. Um, Hmm. And he helped me get my first job, which was at the Inglewood Police Department. I was working at the chief's office and what was amazing about that, going into it, I was nervous because like every black boy, we have a, a fear of the police or like many, um, that at least that I know. I don't want to speak for others experience, mm-hmm. but for those that aren't fearful when they're in uh, the presence of law enforcement, assuming they're not their friend that they know, I'd love to meet those folks to understand what they're doing to cope with that anxiety. That being said, he connected me to this job and I'm going in thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to work for the police. This is crazy. I want this money, but I do I want to do this. I walk in and I meet a man who looks almost exactly like me, like 60 years from that point. I had freckles, light skinned dude, had a beard just like how I got it now. And at the time, I was the only person I knew that looked like me. I was a skinny kid. I was the shortest kid in my class. I had these big Coke bottle glasses. Everybody would joke on me and make fun of me, including my athlete friends. Um, And so in high school, you know, going back to your question, what was my outlet? 
having having some form of work. I took a lot of pride in being able to make it rain for all my friends and buy them all a Pepsi and Pizza Hut in the world with that job mm-hmm. I had at the chief's office. A week into that job, I got a job at a place called Straight Out of Philly, right around the corner by the bus stop. I, I would uh, wait for the bus to get home, and I saw this place and said, I want that money too. So during the summer job, I was working almost seven days a week, just wow. making a little money here and there. And in today's standards, it's not much. But for me at the time at 14, I was able to you know, pay my phone bill. I was able to upgrade a little phone I had, had a little Nokia block thing, right? That <laughs> that was that was a big, big deal yeah. for me. I felt like I was going places. But outside of work, what really energized me and fueled me, it, yeah, it was sports. Track is my through line. I'm a pole vaulter. That was my event. In high school, I ran the hurdles a bit too and did what, you know, all other duties assigned. When it comes to track, that's your job description. You have one event, but then they throw you in the one that you don't want to do every track. Mm-hmm. So that was where I formed a lot of strong relationships, but I also understood, I also started to learn what it meant to compete against yourself, work independently. It was through that, through track and through sports, where I really got to understand what it meant to have to fail, but keep going, right? So what does yeah. it mean when you don't reach the height that you want to clear, but you still have more attempts to go and you still are not in the top three finishers and scoring for your team, Right. You have to also wait another five to 10 minutes before you can go up again. So you got a lot of time to be in your head. So it takes a lot to understand how you can manage and cope with those voices in your head as you perceive yourself to be failing in the moment. And it was track that helped me to really get to a place where I can build that kind of confidence to know, yeah, that happened. I'm going to put that behind me. It's not it's not a big deal right now. What is a big deal is continuing to do all the things that I've practiced a thousand times, literally over and over and over and over and over again from pole plants, from hanging upside down and understanding what it means to have the right form when I'm in the air, all these things, I need to focus on the fundamentals and I need to keep moving forward. These are things and tactics that I I bring into my work life uh, throughout my entire career. That was my outlet for sure um, in high school. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot that you learn from sports and just uh, the consistency, the repetition, the building good habits um, that one can kind of take and, and carry for, for lifelong after that. Talk yeah. to me about senior year of high school. So you're a senior in high school. What do you think is going to happen? And then what actually happens for you? Oh, man. High, senior year of high school, what I think was going to happen, I probably thought I was going to win state championship in the pole vault because, you know, if you go to pole vault camp, apparently you come back a champ. Um, okay. That didn't happen. Uh, but I got all league and I got all county. And I was team captain. That, that was something team captain that I really wanted, probably since I was, you know, a freshman. I was one of those folks coming in. I want to be I want to be the varsity letter winner all four years and be on varsity. I want to be captain as soon as possible. And so, you know, I didn't achieve those thing, things earlier than my uh, well, the captainship early in my senior year, the letter I got in my junior year. But senior year for me, it was really just leaning into that. I was really focused on my sports. I love music and I come from a a family of musicians, artists, singers. So I was engaged in drama as well. And I was a part of the school play, which I had to ultimately give up. I was going to be the second lead and big tap dance on piano, all that stuff. Uh, But I had to give it up because it it competed with track. So, again, you hear the focus on sports. Where did academics come in? I honestly was one of those folks who was just like, I'm here because I'm you know why I'm here. My parents told me to be here. My best mm-hmm. Marshawn Lynch voice. Like, yeah, I did not care. Get fine. <laughs> yeah, I did not care about school whatsoever. I, I really didn't. I only cared in so much as it meant that I can continue to run track and I'll have a good GPA when I apply to colleges, which also mm. was a task for me. So my senior year was not consumed with college applications. At best, you can say it was consumed with figuring out how to, in the most efficient way, with minimal time spent, complete a college application and get accepted somewhere to say, mom, I'm in college. Um, And so I uh, ended up sending in an application to a university that that sent me a mailer, uh, University of Hartford. They asked on the back of this this four panel brochure, name, address, hobbies. And I got another package in the mail a few weeks later saying I was accepted to college. I didn't even know I was applying, but... Um, wow. There you go. So I checked the box and, and I, uh, you know, I was pushing to get on the track team to Paul Vault, all these things. That's, you know, probably for some follow ups. But 
that was my senior year, just really gearing up for that and doing what I needed to do to be able to finish high school, get accepted into college, and then, you know, have the flyest prom date that I can have. I, that, <laughs> that, that's why I'm not even going to lie in front of y'all. I'm not going to sit here and say I was a valedictorian and all of that. I, I just, I was there. <laughs> Got it. That's real. That's real. Yeah. I appreciate that. Did you end up going to that school and what did you end up majoring in? Yeah, yeah. So um, I ended up going there for one semester. My major was political science. Uh, I, so at, at that point, my senior senior year, I'd already known I, I wanted to go to school for law and I wanted to be a lawyer. Political science was, so I was told, you know, the best track. And again, this is where my pop came in and he introduced me to folks that he knew through his work. He had great relationships with local county judges, local prosecutors uh, and defense attorneys who, you know, I got to meet a few of them and he set up time for us to sit down and we'd sit down at the diner in Bergenfield, New Jersey with these folks. And we would uh, they would give me all the all the scoop on what I need to be thinking about when it comes to, you know, studying for law. Pre-law is not the way to go. A lot of people kind of don't take that as serious as other as other liberal arts educate, uh, you know, pathways for education. It was kind of equivalent to, you know, getting a bartender certification. It's like you got to You got it. But no one's going to hire you um, kind of thing. So I went for political science. That was the next best thing. And at University of Hartford, I ended up leaving after a semester only because I was too expensive for them. So my event, the pole vault requires a specific level of insurance because they're human beings flinging their bodies with a tiny little pole more than, you know, 15 feet in the air. God forbid mm-hmm. something happens to me. It's a huge liability. And so I, I spent all this time and this is where the hustle comes in. Right. All I knew is they don't want me to run track here anymore. I brought up my own equipment, which these poles cost eight hundred dollars, you know, oh, pop. Sure. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty expensive, and my high school was kind enough to let me take take the poles that I was using from their inventory to Hartford. I was programming my own workouts, all of these things, and the athletic director sat me down with half his team and was just saying, um, yeah, so you can't do this anymore, and this is where I came in and just started hustling, right? This is a failure moment, right? I can either retreat and let this be as it is, or I can try to make a change here and meet all of their concerns, right? And kind of, you know, check those boxes, address their concerns. And so what did I do? I reached out, like just cold called the 2000 Olympic silver medalist in the pole vault. He uh, was black pole vaulter. And for me at the time was my idol, because again, there weren't, there are not still many black pole vaulters. Oftentimes I'd be like fifth or sixth at, at a meet with really good pole vaulters. And I'll have the local paper coming to me for an interview because you look so athletic and these, all these things, right? You hear some of the stereotypes coming in. Though it's nice to see your name in the newspaper at the same time, right? You, you kind of know like, Hey, you're not the greatest at what you're doing. And, and mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of tough because you don't have anyone to kind of commiserate over that with, because I have no one that looks like me. So I followed this guy forever. And when this moment came, I said, I'm going to reach out to him. Because he also happens to be an aspiring artist. He had some albums out, all these things. So I reached out to the music company. I asked his manager if I could connect with him because I'm desperately looking for someone to help me here and advocate. for me. He offered to actually coach me remotely, like where I would send tapes in the mail to him of like me pole vaulting so he can give me tips. He would send me some workouts, all the all these things. Um, Ultimately, it wasn't enough to convince the school to keep me on board. But it was pretty cool to be interfacing with a former Olympian um, oh, cool. and someone for me who's a, is a legend. And so, yeah, I ended up transferring over to Sacred Heart University and where I finished out my undergraduate studies. And I went there specifically because I was receiving scholarship to pole vault and run track, which was very rare to receive a scholarship for running track unless you're doing multiple events or you're someone who's tracking to go to the Olympics. Um, And so for me to get that for pole vault, I got partial scholarship. It was very, very small to start, but my, my work grew that scholarship over time. But that, that was a big deal for me, not the most cost effective one in the long term, but as a kid, I got a D1 scholarship to run track, which many other folks couldn't, couldn't say at the time. And I took a lot of pride in that. Absolutely. So at the time you're a D1 athlete, a D1, a D1 scholarship athlete. That's looking to go to law school. 
Um, were you yeah. were you doing other things outside of those two very time consuming things? And then tell me about what happens. Um, fast forward a few years when you're about to graduate college and figuring out what what life looks like. Are you looking to be an Olympian? Are you looking to be a lawyer? What happens? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, so I'll say probably the early on the first couple of years, you know, in college running track, I was thinking, you know, I I could be an Olympian. My, my mm-hmm. performance wasn't where it needed to be, but I believed in my work ethic and I knew just with time uh, it, it will come as long as I keep the ethic, the work ethic there. That that over time changed as, you know, I started getting closer to graduation. So I realized, well, you're probably not going to, you know, be in the Olympics, but mm-hmm. you'll be really good in this conference, uh, uh, which was the Northeast Conference, a very regional conference, not the SEC or anything like that or Big East. But yeah, so I had those aspirations. Then with school and my studies, again, it was very, very similar here. So when I transferred to uh, similar to high school, so when I transferred over to Sacred Heart, I actually um, decided to minor in philosophy. And that minor, that decision to go with that minor had a lot to do with, again, my aspirations to become a lawyer and go to law school. So understanding politics, government, our constitution, but also balancing that with classroom understanding of, of ethics. And so in that, I happened to be in a position where I actually decided to double minor about a year and a half in and getting to just like, how did you do all of that? Or like, what were you thinking toward the end of college and planning? None of this was something planned for me. It was, I was sitting down with my advisor and he said, you need a class to fill out your schedule. So you can, you know, have the full-time schedule and get all your credits. It just so happens you only need one class to mm. be a double minor in business economics. So I said, what's the class? Just sign me up for it. Absolutely. It's easy. I, so uh, I, I have a, so I I have a minor that. like that too. So yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, you know, I tell them the double minor, like, oh man, you like, you really must love school. I hated school. I still hate school. I didn't like it. I did not yeah. enjoy it at all. Lots of coffee to stay up in class. It was very dry material, but I knew that it was a piece of paper that would enable me to be more competitive than my peers who did not have it. And if I had the ability to say double minor, that made me more marketable. It was a huge That's differentiator. Cool. And so I went for that and, and did that. So I'm doing all this and I'm pursuing my dreams to become a singer songwriter. So it was this, and I was really, really uh, treated it like a job, to be honest with you. I, I was really aggressive about trying to break into the music industry. And that was really motivated by one day in particular where uh, my freshman year in the summer, I came home. And my mother was crying hysterically and she was crying over bills. She just couldn't pay all the bills in, in that month. And um, I didn't know how, that's how bad things were. And I, I just remember in that moment, I walked away with this feeling of like scorched earth. Like, you know, someone had done her wrong. That kind of reaction, like who's going to get it? Who, 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 Who's getting these hands, right? Who's coming after my brother, my family? So for me, it was, I need to find me a studio because- Enough people tell me I can sing. I said, look, if I can just put something together, I know I could find a way to get myself signed and I can, I, I can change all of this for the better for my mom. I can buy a house. I can do all these things. She'll never have to cry over bills again. And so starting summer freshman year, all throughout college, I was also recording, I was writing, I was performing and balancing all of these things. And for me, when I finished school, it was, I'm going to go to law school. But then as I got closer to my senior year, you know, I had complete projects and I had enough to like have a, my own you know, show and, and really fill out an hour's worth of, of music material. So I wanted to, at that point, actually take a break. Um, and so I talked to my mother about taking a break between undergrad and law school to pursue music. And she said, look, as long as you have a job, she didn't necessarily agree with it, but she said, as long as you have a job, then I'm fine with this and I'll support you. And so my senior year, as I got in toward my senior year, mid junior year, you know, there's also the whole, you're supposed to have internships piece and people are telling me do these things. And they were all free internships that were being thrown my way. And I'm like, look, I got to make money. Like I work, when I go home in the summer, I, I'm making $19 an hour at the hospital to sit around to sit with some, some folks who might be confused or, you know, mm-hmm. in the psych ward and just watch some TV. This was great for an 18 year old to make money just to sit around and watch TV and help out nurses every now and then. At so the time when minimum I, wage is like, what, was 575 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, like, that part, right? So it mm-hmm. was that, like, that was a big deal for me to be able to Absolutely. do that. 
And I didn't want to, I didn't want to work. I knew I would have to work harder than what I was doing at the hospital. I was working the three to 11 shit. So, which was the, the best part, right? Cause at that age, I'm, I don't leave the house till 11 at night to go out. I'm not really getting started mm-hmm. till 12. You know, I could sleep in and still not miss my day at the time. So it was mm-hmm. perfect. So what was the middle ground here? Target. They offered a paid internship that actually mm-hmm. offered an hourly wage that was competitive with what I was earning um, at the hospital. And so I ended up doing a Target internship for the paid internship, again, to check a box. There's a theme here. I, I was not one of those folks who was proactively planning for the future and being strategic about that. It was, I need to do this. I'll find it and get it um, and get it done. So when I got mm-hmm. to the end of my senior year, you know, the only thing that I think I probably thought out well enough was I'm going to be doing music. I'm going to be performing as many as at as many places as possible. I'm going to be writing as many songs as I can and recording as often and whenever possible to make that happen. Everything else will fall behind that. So I just need to find a job that will put money in my pocket to pay bills. That makes sense. I mean, the, the, in Target has a, a good leadership intern program, executive leadership program, I think, I think they call it. Yeah, uh, yeah. My, no, my, yeah. My, my, my wife did that program, so I know I'm, very, I'm pretty familiar with it. And I know they kind of prepare folks to be really good at what they do, whether that's on the floor retail or back office, whatever it is, they kind of prepare you to really grow in that space. Okay, so you graduate. What is your job? And are you still making music? Yeah, still making music. So my job, my first job coming out, I actually didn't have one for probably, I grad, what, when was it, May? Ended up um, not getting a job until October, but I was still working at the hospital. So I just picked up, I was part-time and I was usually every other weekend. So I just started to pick up as many shifts as mm-hmm. I possibly could, like in that time period, while I looked for jobs to perform and stuff like that. And so I ended up getting a job with Wells Fargo Financial. And at the time, I think I can say this now because they went to court and lost over this, but the, the things that they got in trouble for a few years ago with, you know, bad lending practices, there were things that I was observing while I was while I was even working there. But in this first job that I had, for me, it was I just knew I want to make money. Like if I'm not doing mm-hmm. music, like I, I want to have a suit and a tie on. I want to be the boss. I want to be that dude. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and like many folks finish in college. You think because you have the degree now, my title starts at manager or higher, like I'm running things. And so for me, I was looking for those kinds of jobs, white collar jobs that that would make me feel important, I guess, for my ego. And I get this job at Wells Fargo Financial and essentially it's subprime mortgages. It's it's positioned as a message of helping people to, you know, improve their finances, helping them refinance their car loan, for example, to consolidate other forms of debt. Um, yeah. Same with mortgages, things of that nature. But after a few weeks, uh, I was starting to notice that wasn't the case. And a lot of that, I think, had to do with just what I was learning as an economics minor in terms of just standard practices, and what's known to be true about the history of, of loans in this country. Um, yeah. So I had that job, but it wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it would be. And so then I'm, I left that job and picked up a job doing door-to-door sales. I was selling windows and siding, vinyl windows and vinyl siding. Again, mm. it was just, I just need a job so That's I can really. do music at night, right? right? And I just wanted to, at that time, I was like, I just needed to be like some type of title that I can maybe leverage. And I think the time was like sales marketer. Um, and I thought that sounded nice enough for me to work with. When I think about my next office job, if music doesn't work out, but I kept performing. I was performing two to three nights a week in the city. So driving 30, 40 minutes from Jersey into the city. I was recording almost every night uh, wow. for anywhere from two to four hours. Like after work, um, I was pressing all of my own CDs. You know, they call it burning the CDs at the time. So I was burning the CD. I was making a label, pressing it. I was putting it in a little cover slip cover. I, I would sell these things at shows, keep up with mailing lists, social media, wow. even build myself a website, all while doing these things and trying to find trying to find work. So that was my first year out of college. Yeah. Wow. I love that. And I, and I appreciate you sharing that, right? Because I think there's a lot of stuff that people that see you at work today would never know, right? Like one, there's this creative side of you. There's this hustle yeah. side of you. There's this entrepreneur like like being an independent artist is entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> like yeah. 
yeah. bringing all that to the table and trying to like work on your dreams while you're trying to keep food at the table basically right the entire time i think that's I'm important sure. to know and i also appreciate it because some of these jobs are very odd jobs that are not necessarily even things that we would put on our resumes on linkedin today but like they're part of the journey yeah. That get yep. us to where we are today. And, you know, it's important because they help shape that perspective and they played an important role at that time. So I appreciate no, that. No, 100%. I mean, look, those job, the those first two jobs, I don't think you see on my LinkedIn, but I, I've had many, I've had many different odd jobs like uh, yeah. since, since finishing college. But what's on LinkedIn, yeah. I think is the main theme through line. But yeah, man, it's, um, I think life is just filled with like fits and starts, right? Um, and life is not always something that's like, that's planned. I think for me, it's just like, I just have a whole ton of confidence in what I, what I think I can do, even when I'm not sure how to do it. Like, that's just what's been imbued in me. Like at eighth grade, I wish I had the yearbook here. It says, Ian will be most determined. They had like eight things people voted on, like, you know, most popular, most this, most that, most determined, Ian Strauder. So even like at the age of, was I in eighth grade, 13? So even at that age, yeah. Like I, I was, you know, I, I was like a dog with a bone. If there was something that I wanted to do, it, it was very difficult to convince me that I wasn't capable of doing mm, it. I say capable is very different than being allowed or able to uh, do it. So talk to me about what happens uh, for the next few years until you get to this point. Like, what is that, that first moment when you get a job that is kind of in that career through line that you're like, and how did that come about? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first job was with um, Bergen County Community Action Partnership, now known as Greater Bergen Community Action. And that job uh, was by way of my pop. He was working there at the time. I think he was tired of hearing me complain about like the, the outdoor sales job that I had. It was very, it became to be a very uncomfortable job. It was definitely like a boiler room. You get dropped in the middle of like a neighborhood that is very affluent um, and easily made skeptical of these folks and hooded windbreakers who they know don't live there and are just knocking on doors and oddly staring at people's houses to try to figure out or even touching them to see, all right, is that is that vinyl? Is that clad siding? What material is that? Can I talk to them? And it was getting cold. So I started in the summer and now it's getting cold. Daylight savings time. The day is shorter. It's dark at four o'clock and I'm still out there knocking on doors. My, I was telling all this to my pop and he's just like, look, there's something here I heard that's opened up. Would you mind being an administrative assistant? Nope. I would love that. I'll be inside. It is not cold and I don't have to do all this nonsense. Like sometimes people got stopped by the police, almost arrested for what they were doing. So I just need to get out of there. And so I got this job at a nonprofit. And at the time, like, Nonprofit. It's completely counter to what I described where I saw myself, you know, senior year. I'm gonna be a boss, I'm make money, all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I started off in with the weatherization program. And I, my job was just at the time, I was just shuttling things back and forth from this satellite office that was three towns away to the main headquarters. Um, and then after the first week, my boss at the time, who like he, this is a guy that's on like he's on every like APB and milk carton and just you don't let him within 100 feet of a school, civil or nothing. The guys, it was about time he got let go. He was doing some really sketchy things and he was let go. They brought in someone from Johnson Controls to run the weatherization team. And his name was Phil Glowey. Uh, he, he sat me down and he said, look, you're the only one with a degree here. So I'd like you to be a purchase aid, our purchasing agent. I didn't know what that meant, but I did ask if I get a badge. I thought that'd be cool. And well, I also get some business cards because I thought that would be nice to make me feel like an adult to have business cards in my hand that I give to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's how I got my start, man. And when I uh, in that role, you know, this is the first time I felt like I got real mentorship from my mm -hmm. uh, manager that I was working with. Like he told me he taught me the odds and ends from negotiation to holding contractors accountable to pipeline management, procurement rules, setting up processes. Like all of these things I, I learned from him and in doing so in that one one first in that first year, rather, uh, of doing that work, I was able to save the company close to three hundred thousand um, dollars on all their materials purchases, um, as well as their subcontractor costs. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it was a it was a big yeah. deal for me uh, starting my career there. I ultimately moved on from that purchasing agent role 
into another role. And this was kind of unplanned. It was just, I wanted to make more money. I had, I'd been looking for other jobs at the time and I got an offer to be a purchase agent somewhere else. I, I don't even remember where it was. It's like one of those weird office parks, like, you know, like a Teterboro like town in New Jersey, which is office parks and you just go there to work. So nothing was really exciting about it. It was really B2B transactions. And so hmm. uh, the CEO got wind that I was looking to leave. I was getting froggy and I was looking to leave. And he said, uh, he pulled me in. They had this war room, him and the COO. They closed the door to this room. It was this room, is it's small, 10 by 10 at most. And there's a square table that's probably six by six. And they keep all these newspapers scattered on it. There's etchings on the wall of things they're working on. And I'd only been in there maybe one other time. So my perception is this is the room where things happen mm-hmm. and I'm sweating bullets. I'm nervous. I think I'm in trouble. They're like, what are you trying to do? Strong arm? I, I thought that's what I was walking into. Instead, I walked into a warm reception with this door closed where I got to hear the COO and the CEO play back to me or give me a readout rather of all the great reviews I received from my manager uh, wow. with regards to the work that I was doing in weatherization. And they said to me, we'd like to keep you here. We have this amazing um, initiative that we're getting ready to launch called Cap Solar. Uh, it's going to be, at the, it ended up being a $10 million initiative. At, but at that time, they were speculating uh, around 20 to $25 million in partnership with Goldman Sachs Urban Investment Group. Now, me, at this time, I'm still in my music bag, right? So I got mm-hmm. a little frohawk going, got the clean sides, got a little fake. I, I, you know, the only thing professional about me was the collar button up shirt I I, I had, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I clearly look like this guy's committed to something else when he is leaving here. And that is his real full-time job. But they offered me this position. They told me to name my number and I named it. I should have went way higher, uh, but I <laughs> named my number and it was the most money I had ever made at that time. And it was great. They made That's the like, immediate change the next day and I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. That's amazing. I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, you named the number that is high to you at the moment. Right. Not uh, like it was higher than whatever you had seen to that point. Uh, so, yeah. that, so that makes a lot of sense. That's awesome. Um, yeah. and I, but I also I, didn't have like I, I didn't have people around me. I'm bringing this up. I heard someone say this earlier today, uh, a DEI executive talking about, you know, their upbringing and being the first in their family. You know, you hear like a oh, first gen college student, but they're, you know, first gen corporate professional. Me as well. <laughs> My mother worked in a hospital setting. She was a respiratory therapist. It, what you get is what you get, right? You, in a union, the wages there. I had, I didn't really have anyone that talked to me about salary negotiation, even though I probably could have leaned on my pop for that. And so, yeah, in that room, I mean, if had I had that, I, I certainly would have probably asked for more. But yeah, you know, you live and you learn. That makes sense. So tell me about this role. So you stepped into this role. How long did you do that for? And what kind of comes after this this yeah. chapter of your life when you're when you're in this organization? So, yeah, I mean, the, the role, uh, I was a program manager for Cap Solar, And so, you know, I was, I was a part of all the work that our CEO and our board treasurer were doing with Goldman Sachs, uh, CFO as well, to, to really model out what, you know, what the program would look like, the, the financial waterfalls, all of that. Uh, we were leveraging new market tax credits, something that was very foreign to all of us, including our CFO at the time. I knew nothing about solar. So, we were really just kind of building the ship as it goes. And we were learning how to actually drive a ship. And I guess for, you know, uh, lack of better words in that analogy, I guess, build the ship as well at the same time. And so uh, once we started the program, my job was essentially to bring on nonprofits to fill in our pipeline commitment. So our goal was to install four megawatts of solar panels on the roofs of of nonprofits throughout New Jersey for free, with the caveat that if they have asbestos laden roof, or roof repair to that's required to uh, be able to uh, support those solar panels, that they would have to fund that. But there's an added benefit besides the free solar that you're getting, right? And that savings on electricity. We are giving up 50% of our developer fee for each of these projects with whomever signed on. This is unrestricted money now that can be programmed in any way that these nonprofits would like to see it programmed. You can give a raise to a frontline worker you can give a scholarship to some frontline workers, especially single parents who, you know, I've worked with many who aspire to go to college. And I hear often, you know, once I save up enough to go to college, I'm going to go to college. College is 
very expensive and it's nearly impossible to save up for. We know this um, making a salary that's close to minimum wage, barely above it. Right. Yeah. So the, to be able to offer this developer fee, it went leaps and bounds. Uh, some folks used it to help pay for the repairs that they needed to do on their roofs. Others did reprogram it. And everyone that participated saw a 10 to 15 percent savings or rather is seeing rather still. Uh, 10 to 15 percent savings in their power bills. And for Greater Bergen, who developed this for-profit power company, they're receiving a whole ton of unrestricted revenue by way of these energy payments that are being made month over month. Mm -hmm. So it, it means a lot for the institution as well. So for me, it was a phenomenal opportunity to be able to work with members of our board, our CEO, um, our C, uh, COO. And, and just really expand my exposure across the organization. And I, in doing that, you know, I was able to then get more responsibility. So I took on work to help to save our weatherization program when Republicans took over in 2010 during Obama's first administration. And they completely defunded the weatherization program and the CDBG program in particular. There were monies coming from the American Restoration and Re, uh, Reinnovation Act or Recovery Act. I always get those R's wrong. That was added on top of what we normally get. So imagine going from $5 million in your bank account one day to $150,000 in your bank account one day. I'm mm. sure if T-Pain's watching this, he, he's shaking his head, right? He's like, yeah, that was me. Um, but that's what, ha that's what literally happened to more than 1,100 institutions mm. providing this offering, this service offering. And so I, I was asked to zoom in to think about how we could develop a fee-for-service model around this so we could save and retain jobs. And so I worked to develop grassroots strategies as well to where in the weatherization team that already was there would simply do, thing, do things as simple as going around the block, introducing themselves to the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone qualifies for free services through this grant. You have to be at or below the poverty line based on your family level. If you miss by a penny, you still have to pay. So let's market to everyone that we know won't qualify. Let's look at those folks that applied and were disqualified. For those folks that were disqualified, we want to be a responsible partner to them, right? And helping them to find savings in their uh, electric bills month over month. So we can't just charge these people a fee. That's quite predatory. We mm -hmm. happen to have, and it's misaligned with our values, right? As an anti-poverty agency. So- Let's leverage our credit union and let's open up more accounts. The credit union, a bank is in the business that, of giving loans. That's how they make money. So let's get them connected there with that loan. They're going to get a, sa a savings account that's opened up for them. They're going to get access to financial counseling supports and services that is there. And this loan that, we'll put, that we would provide them, the loan would be structured so that the monthly payment aligns to the anticipated electric savings, electric bill savings month over month. So though they're not seeing in the beginning of savings over the long term, once they're done paying that loan down, they'll be able to experience that. So it's a one, it, it's basically no felt difference, but now your home is more energy efficient. And within the next two to five years, depending on how long your loan term was, you'd be in a position then to see that considerable savings. And now you can do so much more with that money, right? Got it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. And that kind of starts your career in in field, building some of that through line, right? When you talk about energy, when you talk about workforce, when you talk about all of these things kind of coming together, like that yeah. seems like the genesis of it all for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and it was through the Cap Solar work where I'm selling these nonprofits. Like I have to deal with their boards. So it's mm -hmm. not just, you know, a mid-level staff. I'm dealing with the CEO and then I have to talk to, I have to present to a board or I have to prep the CEO to be able to give the right sell to the board. And so I really understood what it meant to have to, you know, adapt my communication style and, and really have a message that resonates with different audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, for me, what became very helpful when you fast forward into where I went next after Greater Bergen, I ended up making a pivot into workforce development. I had a few fits and starts that uh, uh, we could talk about, but that's ultimately like what helped me the most when it came to my starting workforce where I was a job developer. Mm -hmm. It was that muscle I developed doing that kind of sale where I'm, I now I can talk to a business owner, mm -hmm. a small business owner around the block, or I can go to Kramer Levin and talk to folks in a big corporate environment 
and still meet them where they're at um, to convince them to create jobs for individuals who otherwise would not be able to have those positions. So tell me about that job where you were mostly focused then on workforce development and yeah. kind of what were you tasked with doing there? Yeah. So um, it was Fountain House where I got my start. Um, they're based in Hell's Kitchen mm-hmm. on 47th and 9th. They're a mental health organization. They're one of, uh, I think now about three, let's call it over 300, call them clubhouses around the world. Um, and, and these organizations, these institutions, they vary in size. They can be five staff. They can be 100. But the whole goal is to create an environment where the clients, what they call members, these individuals with mental illness, have a place to go where they can they can feel their value once again. And so why, how was that done? Well, that's done by way of the relationship with their case managers. So members are working side by side with staff to help the organization advance toward its mission and its goals. Members are uh, serving on the board. Members um, are traveling with executives uh, and staff at all levels, for that matter, or meetings that they might have, and they are participating in those meetings. So when I go to London to do work for Fountain House, I have someone with me meeting with local council members to talk about how we can have partnerships that enable us to be able to create opportunities for folks in places like Brixton, where social classism prevents them from getting jobs with folks like, with, with I won't name them, but American-based conglomerates. Uh, so th- it, it ran the gamut. But in there, in that is where I really understood what workforce development is. I thought a job was a job. You just go to Indeed and then you call them and then you can put somebody in it. Uh, but it's so much, so much, so much more than that. And so yeah. at Fountain House, I really understood what it meant to, to take time to really understand the individuals that you're serving and really understand how you can craft a compelling narrative that doesn't position a partnership with an employer as charity, right? But it's an exchange of us helping them meet their business bottom line, but Mm. in doing so and having that be met, enabling an individual to tangibly feel what their value is, right? And see it by way of that paycheck that they're finally getting for the first time in five, 10 or more years that they've not been able to get work because they just haven't had the strong system around them, a strong village around them Mm -hmm. uh, to help them uh, enable their success. Most importantly, enabling that success during their failure and the failures in their lows. There was a lot of this medication management that can impact an individual's ability to be able to show up effectively to work, all of these things. And Fountain House provides supports to the point where literally through one of their programs called Transitional Employment, staff are going on site and they are literally filling, they're working the job if a member couldn't show up for uh, for their shift. So the Federal Reserve was one of our partners. The CFO was assigned to that. Every now and then you might see the CFO shoveling and sweeping and taking out trash outside of the Federal Reserve. That is the extent of the services that they were providing. And that was my first like jump into workforce development. Yeah. Hmm. Also, I, I do want to point out the it's a slight irony, as you mentioned, in the when you're about to graduate college and you're like, I'm all about the money. I'm all about the money to I'm going to work in nonprofits, basically. And then when I do make <laughs> a pivot out of that, it's going to go into government. <laughs> so like, uh, but, but, but yeah. I mean, in, in fairness, right, I do think there that part of part of what I want to get across with this conversation and through this podcast generally is, you know, you can continuously grow in your career in these sectors and you can make money in these sectors. And just because it's a nonprofit doesn't mean you're a nonprofit. Like that doesn't mean that. Right. So uh, tell me about how you kind of transfer these skills then to position yourself for kind of pivoting sectors. Right. It was still mission aligned, but you did end up pivoting sectors at some point. Oh yeah. I mean, even when I moved over to Fountain House, it's a pivot from what I was doing over at Greater Bergen. Right. So between Fountain House and Greater Bergen, I got a job with a nonprofit, Harlem United. I was really excited about the job. I interviewed for a job that was just above my reach, but they liked me so much, they brought me on anyway, and they created a salary line for me. They ultimately let me go about a month and a half in. And at the time, I had no idea beyond the fact that it was, I was told it was emails, the strong word emails. I was like, okay, you know, show me examples. I couldn't get the, I couldn't get what I, you know, really was looking for or wanted. But as an at will employee, they can get rid of me for whatever reasons they choose. I found out about a year later what 
uh, ended up happening is they, they laid me off because there was an issue with a grant on another EVP salary and they needed to make the money work, which I completely understand. But at the time, I, I didn't know what to do because I, I was always this overperformer, overachiever. I, I hmm. This hit hard. Uh, we weren't playing basketball. It's so the only thing I'll tell you I'm just horrible at. So I was wondering what was going on. And so what did it mean to feel like the, or feel like to make that pivot? The, the first pivot I made was because Fountain House was a 1099 contract position. So I felt like, hey, I can feel more confident in standing behind what it is that I want to effectuate, right? Standing behind my vision and not worry about being retaliated against or let go for whatever reason. And so while I was at Fountain House, I, I was able to do a lot. In my three and a half years there, I created an employer advisory board. It was through, I won't take credit for this, it was a colleague of mine, Dorothy Orr, has been with Fountain House for like 20 years. And when Mayor de Blasio became mayor, every day she said, I'm going to, I'm calling their office because the first lady goes to my church and I think we could get jobs there. She ended up getting a meeting one day. This is someone that she doesn't like selling. She'll tell you this admittedly to the whole world. She's not Mm -hmm. the developer type. Uh, so I said, let me go with you so we can you can have me to close. And so we went to the mayor's office and I meet Martha Jackson, who ended up becoming my boss uh, at the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Uh, she was the assistant commissioner there at the time. She sat on our employer advisory board and it was through through that partnership where she was able to see me in action and see how I was developing relationships. I was cultivating those relationships very strategically, and I was engaging them in the mission to create broader access to jobs for individuals with mental illness. And so Martha wanted to bring that the, all those things, those strengths over to what she was building at the time, a program that was quietly known as NYC at Work. Uh, at the time, she had uh, uh, raised funds from private philanthropic institutions to pay for salary lines. So this the city put no money into this at the time. But I ended up joining and coming on uh, to that team about a year after, probably a year and a half, actually, after I first met Martha. And then at the mayor's office, I expanded that work I was doing with developing jobs, not just for individuals with mental illness, but now I was doing that for the entire disability community throughout New York City. And so through that, I was interfacing with over 100 different employment partners, businesses and companies of all sizes from you know, local local art galleries and banks to large multinational um, clothing retailers like Uniqlo, um, and it was through it was through that office where in that work because I had the jobs, all the nonprofits that we worked with through our talent coalition, they were reaching out to me. There's about oh, wow. seventy of them, right? Yeah. About how they could refer their candidates, get into jobs, and things of that nature. And so that's where the ecosystem building started to happen. Really zoom out. And understand how you can align needs across these competing entities, right? These nonprofits who all want their people to only have these jobs, align them so that we can let all boats rise and create equity here uh, of uh, through that opportunity. And in that exercise as well, strategically positioning the employer to have access to training and technical assistance to understand best practices for engaging with specific disability populations engaging with employers to help them to understand and develop reasonable accommodation processes that might otherwise were uh, just were not in existence uh, before working with the mayor's office. And so uh, that that's what ultimately set me up for um, the partnerships position that I had that where I met you at EDC. You know, I think that's one of the things that I, that I appreciate. I, you know, I think you and I you and I overlapped when we were at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, which is a quasi-government agency um, that works on, that manages a lot of property on behalf of the city and is tasked with ultimately generating job growth um, and economic vitality in the city in many different ways that they do that. Um, so, you know, I think when you started there, I was there, I was there in, 20, in 2017, end of 2017, mm-hmm. through two years ago, right? Um, I think when you came on board, folks were really excited because you were bringing a lot of that um, workforce background and you were tasked with really leading some of the initiatives there in workforce yeah. development partnerships in a way that the agency didn't have yet at the time. So you were kind of basically spearheading a brand new initiative <laughs> um, within the organization. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what you what you were tasked with doing there and how that how that ended up going? 
Man, look, uh, before I even get to that, I'll tell you, I was scared to death coming yeah. into the job. I, I was, I, I remember saying to my friends, my interview for the mayor's office job was the most important one in my life. And then I remember when the EDC opportunity became available, uh, it was the same thing, same moment. And it, it was just because like all my interactions with EDC at the time, I told this to my boss. I, I, I say this to anyone uh, who I worked with at EDC or who's still there now. But when EDC was in the room, it was like the men in black showed up, right? We Like mm-hmm. something big was happening. And, um, you know, it, and it, you always had the, the right things to say. EDC folks came in. It was always the right things to say. They were always on point. And, and there's really smart, whip smart, intelligent folks there um, who are coming from a pedigree that on paper I felt I didn't match with. Right. So, you know, I was really dealing with that imposter syndrome for a little bit. And it was very, very intimidating for me coming in because I didn't want to fail. So, you know, when I came yeah. in, you know, my remit was really, really making sure that EDC was developing a robust set of relationships with workforce development organizations throughout New York City's workforce ecosystem. So that not only includes nonprofit institutions and community-based organizations that are delivering these programs, but it also includes agencies you know, within the city of New York that are delivering on these as well, really with the goal of just, hey, let's make sure people are aware of, the, let's start by just making sure people know what we do. And then from there, let's start to look, think deeper about specific stakeholders and those audiences to understand where we can uh, really deepen that relationship even further, right? And really start to get tactical to talk about, you know, specific ongoing work that they could potentially be partnering with us on and vice versa, really listening closely to understand how EDC can be a good partner to these institutions, right? Whether it be by way of simply signing a letter of support to helping to set up strategy sessions, which we did for Department of Veteran Services, as an example, with our strategy team to have a facilitated brainstorm, or whether it be actually bu- you know, building and operating a program together or an initiative together, um, like this, uh, like Civic Hall um, at uh, the Union Square Tech Training Center. That was really what my remit was, I believe. Uh, so I heard in terms of what prompted the creation of my role, it was it came out of the failings of Amazon HQ2 um, and some of the negative sentiment that came there from the workforce community. You know, so for me, anytime I felt uncertain about what I needed to do, it was making sure that no one ever again could feel like we're making a repeat mm-hmm. of whatever those missteps were, um, what that EDC perceived that they that they had in Amazon HQ2 or the community felt that they had on HQ2. I just wanted to make sure people felt like they could say, man, I had a seat at the table and EDC almost to a point of, you know, eager desperation wants to be our friend and wants to be a good partner to us and truly believes in our mission, believes in our values and believes in our goals. And they think that it could really strongly augment and add value to the work that they're doing to build strong, resilient, thriving, economically thriving communities throughout it's a great city. You did some great work while you were there um, for about two years or so, and you left as a assistant vice president um, of workforce development, right? Um, workforce yeah. development partnerships. Tell me about what leads to that decision to ultimately leave an organization like EDC and what you end up doing next. Yeah. So I ended up moving into consulting. I'll tell you again, he, <laughs> talk about themes and through lines, right? Just like high school, just like college. I'm at this point now where this wasn't planned. In fact, I really wasn't looking to leave EDC. I found myself to be very, very happy working there. Every meeting, you know, though we were talking about serious things um, and, and and really hard work, intense work, I, I'm smiling. People are always thinking out, outside of the box. No idea is a bad idea. It's always on the table. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was ama- an amazing place to be. And you know the people and, and people respected you. I, you. You know you work at EDC. There's a there's a cachet that comes with it, and I started to feel that. I'm not to say I didn't feel that before, but it, it just felt different, right? Um, in in terms of how you are seen, and so for me, I happened to at the time. This is right around the the time where the city was really uh, deeply entrenched in developing a strategy for offshore wind, and so um, at that time, I find myself in all of these webinars. 
different presentations about, yeah, it's still in the pandemic, so we're all on Zoom about offshore wind. And I end up uh, developing a relationship with the founder of Carp Strategies, uh, Rebecca Carp, uh, herself a former EDCer. And, you know, we started talking about some you know, open roles she had and was need, she was looking for folks to, to fill them and, you know, start off with, can you share with your network? See if you know anybody, uh, I appreciate, you know, the help. If you know anyone that's interested in the role. And then, you know, as we talked more and got to know each other more, she approached me about joining the organization. And, you know, for me um, at the time, I, I wasn't sure. I had my own freelance work that I, you know, had been doing. I opened up a shop, had LLC for all the, you know, transactional reasons. But I didn't aspire to, you know, create the next Bain or McKinsey or anything like that. I was doing my own little freelance thing on the side to Mm -hmm. just further develop myself and my skills toward where I wanted to be. At at this point in my life, I knew I want to be an executive in the nonprofit space right now, about the time I'm at the mayor's office and going into EDC. So she saw this and said, you know, why don't you join us and be a director? You know, you got some experience, uh, you know, in consulting. Why don't you come on? And it was a great opportunity where I have an opportunity to be managing a large, a large team. Uh, I think we're at the time when I joined, we're approaching 20 folks. So I get to manage multiple project teams. I have direct reports and a considerable increase on the salary that I was making at the time and a good title. So I wasn't losing uh, in terms of that, like upward mobility and title, right? And, and what makes you marketable. I wasn't losing that in my through line. I wasn't oh. losing that. And, and, you know, and I guess if I, I'm thinking of like a sports card analogy, if you look at the back of my card, my stat line will show that progression. So there was that strategically working for me toward my goal. Now I'm certain, right? Even though I didn't plan to leave, like I wasn't really thinking about proactively where I'm going to go to college, all those things. Um, and what I wanted to do after college while I was there. In this case, I did know if I made a move strategically, it needed to push me further toward my goal of being a nonprofit leader. Um, and so there, um, I ultimately, it was hard, but I, you know, I made a decision to leave EDC because I saw that there was a huge opportunity as it pertained to my professional goals to take advantage of here. And moving over to CARP as a director, you know, I was uh, on the member of the leadership team, really responsible for overseeing pro- uh, teams working on project delivery, but also contributing toward the growth, advancement, scaling of the institution. Um, and so uh, in that time, my two years there, you know, I started off as director. A year in, I was then promoted to principal and worked on a variety of different projects. My first, one of my first projects was working with Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Transit Authority um, on their Emerald Trail project, which is uh, public and announced now. Uh, but uh, that that was a great project where we were helping to negotiate an MOU with their community partners so they can get mm-hmm. their work, that work moving. I take a lot of pride in what's going to come with that 34 mile trail. It's going to connect disparate communities, many of which are low income communities that are subject to high flood risk, get minimal capital resources. And it's uh, because the way the city's designed it makes it really difficult for individuals in these communities to access jobs and opportunities. Mm. Um, but also access the downtown corridor where, you know, money could be spent uh, because you got to keep the economy in mind. Right. Um, so with this 34 mile trail, it's going to connect all of that um, and enable the expanse of micro mobility throughout the city. The expanse, again, of access to good, high paying jobs, access to a better quality of life experience. I'm talking about, you know, leisurely things that you might do to be able to go out, go to the game, go to the mall, do these things, go to a bar that's near mm-hmm. the stadium and watch the game. This trail is going to enable that and it's going to bring people and communities together. And by way of this connected trail, enabling more investment as well into these disparate communities, because now there's a connection to the things that might seem more attractive in terms of this, is where I want to see the ROI come from, if I'm putting my money here in this infrastructure. Um, so that was my first project, all the way to offshore wind, where we're helping developers think about how they're entering the market and more importantly, how they're making uh, true economic investments that are not just cookie cutter investments into the community that enables the creation of jobs, investment in programs that provide and offer more jobs, training, scholarships, uh, safe spaces for folks in uh, the LGBTQIA plus community to be able to convene, all of those things. So it was a wide, vast range of work that I was able to really get exposed to, a really fast-paced environment 
Um, mm-hmm. And so it was a place where I don't want to say it wasn't trial by fire, but I definitely was being forged there uh, for, for something more. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a great, great opportunity. I, I miss those folks a lot, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm really glad to say that there's going to be a day where we have the Gateway Tunnel built. Mm-hmm. And on that day, you're going to be able to say, I know the guy who helped to make that happen. Uh, that was awesome. one of the final things we helped make happen before I uh, helped make happen before I left. Um, okay. I found out shortly after that the team we're on was actually awarded to do the work. So we're doing community outreach to make sure the whole community knows about what's coming and to make mm-hmm. sure that they understand what's available to them in terms of access to local jobs, because, you know, those local hiring agreements and PLAs, they're, they're very real. And uh, Gateway Development Commission, Port Authority, New Jersey Transit, City of New York, all the folks involved, they see that very seriously. Um, and uh, so I, I'm take, I take a lot of pride in knowing that, you know, I get to work with a group that helps to, you know, really help folks meet those goals. No, that makes sense. And, you know, I, I definitely uh, know and appreciate Rebecca as well. Um, th- definitely there's something about that EDC water. Like once you go through those doors that you can kind of just continue to grow and do great things beyond that. And as you said, she went through those doors and then found yeah. other people like yourself that, that went through those doors. So, you know, definitely um, have interacted with both as a client um, when I was at EDC and just working to see the great work that comes out of that shop, how you yeah. all are thoughtful, strategic, engaging, and then just kind of maintaining a personal relationship with her. So appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that. And I know that must have been, you know, a big shift, right, to go from an organization that's about 350 some odd employees to a smaller shop, right, um, which I know they grew a lot while you were there. And they, I think, are hovering around like at least 30 some odd employees or so um at this point but you know which is amazing <laughs> for yeah. for an organization um that handles that that volume of work so would like to fast forward tell me when you walk in on mondays what does your job look like today what are you doing what are you tasked with doing um and remind folks where you're working where you're doing yeah yeah uh so yep as a reminder Chief Program Officer at uh, Bedford Service and Restoration Corporation and six weeks into the job. So this this could change tomorrow. Who knows? You know, my day to day when I wake up, you know, and getting to work first, it's, it starts off with a workout. You could be better at that these days, uh, but uh, usually starts off with a workout in the morning, really get the juices flowing, do a few brain games. I have a lot of coffee. You know, I'm in, you know, around nine o'clock and um, I'm off to the races uh, from there. So you know, I'm checking in with my teams to see how folks are doing, kind of inventorying any any fires that need to be put out, uh, starting to work the triage those in the morning. A lot of my work is really just spent with just like mapping out my day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on Monday, that that exercise is focused on mapping out the week. So I'm typically meeting with my program leadership team to understand, you know, what we have on deck for the week. What are the urgent critical items that uh, need to be raised to my attention that require me to ha- kind of unstick, troubleshoot. Um, what kind and of then programs? I'm these programs that we're uh, offering there at uh, Best Side Restoration runs the gamut. So we have weatherization where we're doing energy efficient upgrades to folks' homes. We have financial uh, empowerment program. Uh, we're offering financial counseling to uh, Best Side residents. We have training and placement services that we offer. So we do that through our Jobs Plus program. We also do that through a non-Jobs Plus training and uh, placement program group Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, We have a tax prep team, so we offer tax prep services as well. Last year, we helped uh, 5,000 people get $6 million in uh, tax refunds, something that we are working very diligently to repeat uh, this year. And I feel like I'm leaving... Some folks out. We have a home ownership program as well there, where uh, we actually just uh, received HUD certification. So we're really happy about that. You know, really working to help people get access to affordable housing and helping them with providing counseling that enables them to be able to have a pathway to home ownership. Okay, that makes sense to me. I appreciate that. And okay, so a lot of really great programming that comes out of that. And I know I've overlapped with uh, with your organization in different ways. Um, you'll have a national reputation and have historically done some really good work for decades now. One of the things that's important to me is making sure that people don't think just because you're a nonprofit, you cannot make a good living. Um, Can you talk to folks about generally what someone can make in this type of role as a chief program officer? Uh, Yeah, it it depends on size uh, of the organization and, you know, financial health. But 
location. You know, I've, I've seen, yeah, and location. Yeah, I, I've seen salaries as low as the mid, you know, 100s, you know, mid to low 100s. So let's call that, you know, as low as 125. If you're a smaller organization, I've actually seen lower. And again, depending on location. Uh, so there's there's executives I've worked with in places like Florida, for example, where this, you know, CEOs, you know, barely touching 95. So it, it can really vary. Um, but you can go as high as, you know, 200, 200 plus, depending on the organization that you're working with. Mm-hmm. I fall in that range. Um, so I, I won't share my number uh, uh, here for the audience, but I will say, you know, going to that, you know, that note or that comment of like, you know, working in nonprofit doesn't mean you can't make profit. Right. There's also something to be thought of, thought about in terms of your, what makes you happy in your job. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily have to love what you do, but you, you have to like being there. And what I will say is that my mom used to say this a, a, a lot. It's not her quote, obviously, but more money, more problems. Right. Like with with that money, there comes a certain level of stress that comes along with it. Right. Um, the set of problems that not a lot of people realize you're going to have to deal with. And when they do, you know, might look back and say, if I knew my younger self knew this, I maybe wouldn't want to deal with this. Right. So mm-hmm. I think that the thing to that I always want to impart to people is, yeah, you can make good money working in the nonprofit space. You can make even better money working in the for-profit space or outside of city government. But what I will tell you is that if you make a decision solely based on money, I found that you're very likely to find yourself in a place where you're not happy in that situation, or you feel like you're not set up to succeed because the the thought about more money so greatly overshadowed mm-hmm. the, considerations for your capability, your aptitude, and being proactive to, to see and identify where you potentially might have obstacles so you can actually know those are coming, navigate them, and be successful in the world. So uh, for me, I tell folks all the time, that is the biggest piece. If you're happy there, everything else will start to follow behind it, right? You'll get more responsibility. You'll have people that want to follow you and work for you as well as with you, right? Because you're happy with what you're doing and you take pride and enjoy it. Those are the biggest things. And one quick plug on the city, though, you know, government employment is government employment. In a place like the city of New York, they've got a great pension and they've got great benefits. EDC, they offered the same things as a quasi-governmental agency, less the pension, but a strong, uh, strong, I think it was a 403B that we got, uh, as well as great benefits, very affordable in terms of what I was coming out of pocket for month over month and very affordable in terms of what I was left to pay when I presented my insurance card at the end of the day. So I will say that when I think about those, you know, those pros and cons, you know, what you're giving and taking, yeah, get more money, but you might not get the best insurance that you want. You're likely not going to get a pension. That's not, there's not many places offering a pension nowadays, right? Yeah. But if you're thinking about government work, I know a lot of people that work in government, they started at 21, 20 years old, they're 30 and they've retired. And in that time frame, they might have elevated to a position where they are at a mid to senior you know, level position in leadership. And when they retire, they're going to be able to get that payout for the rest of their life and all those benefits. So you can't say that about a lot of other places, um, to be honest. with you. That's fair. That makes sense. Are there any forms of media, books, movies? music, podcast that have shaped you personally or professionally? Yeah, I would say, well, I'm trying to think of a few. Right now I'm reading uh, The First 90 Days. That book has been very helpful for me coming into this new role. Mm -hmm. I think as a strategic thinker, it's really easy for things to go big and you get lost in all of that kind of abstractness as you're trying to make sense of all these different things that you're learning about. You know, So for example, with restoration, we can we have so many programs and we have millions of dollars of funding that comes through to, to service those programs. And we have dozens of funders that we work with and we get multiple funders um, on uh, on each program. So there's a lot uh, there's a lot to make sense of there. Meanwhile, there are roughly 50, about 50 folks that are working under the programs department. So there's those folks that you have to get to know. You have to understand a work culture. Thing, you know, all these things. So for me, it's really shaped me. I kind of geek out over books like that. There's another book um, called Project Management for Millennials. I actually read that at EDC during the pandemic. I found it to be ridiculously impactful for me. 
mm-hmm. uh, especially when it came to managing my my flagship projects and moments where you know you I saw I needed to step up and I needed to take a more greater leadership role amongst this inter, amongst an interdepartmental group uh, working on uh, on a project and so that that was helpful and then the founder of Tom's this I haven't read this book in so many years and I'm forgetting. Uh, what it's called, but he he wrote a book, um, and I will say you just Google him, find that 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 one stood with me for a long time, and it was just all about his journey in terms of how he started up the company and you know his mission, you know his mission based kind of uh, work that he does through that B Corp. Mm-hmm. That really resonated with me in terms of where I saw myself headed um, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, you know, and, and just like how to have that mindset and really like kind of meet people where they are and inspire others. Got it. Start start something that matters. Yes, that is it. Start something that matters. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. I know it's pretty easy to look at you and say, you know, this guy looks like he has all his stuff together. Can you mention anything or any time in your life that was particularly not as linear, either um, something that you had to overcome or endure that just kind of made things not as pleasant as people would look at it from outside and say, oh, that guy has always had his stuff together. Yeah. Um, it was being it was being let go. It was being fired from uh from Home United. Okay. Um, hey Kelsey, yeah, he knows who he is. I keep receipts. Um, but if he saw what we said, talked about talked about earlier, yes, he'll understand that I understand. And, That's uh, fair. It's all good. I love uh, it. Forgiveness okay. is big, key. But that was that was a big uh, that that was a big obstacle for me to get over. And it was like you know after I look, I, it was just crazy four month span. So Mm -hmm. I leave Greater Bergen Community Action. That happened. It was a kind of a pride driven moment as as well. It was just getting to a point where I felt like I was reaching this kind of a glass ceiling. I was being assigned to special projects. And I I know I'm kind of sidelining or digressing now, but, you know, I get this uh, and I'm going to be transparent here because I feel like we don't hear enough of folks who who are, you know, face value. We think they have it all together. We don't hear enough of them talking about like where they had their moments. Right. So for me, in this case, uh, that moment was, was receiving a memo that, you know, from someone who was two, two doors down from me that was saying, you know, I'd like you to cease and desist the COO at the time, like on working on the uh, working on grants and stuff. Cause I asked a lot of questions. I reported to the CEO and I think the person I was working with at the time, it would, you know, understandably so we're human beings. I might be thinking, Hey, you know, are you a plant? Are you, are you out here snitching? Like, what? you know, I don't know if you're doing anything wrong. I'm just trying to learn. So I have all these questions, but unfortunately this moment happens. And I, you know, for me, uh, I'd say some immaturity that was involved, but I, I said, you know what? I'm going to find something better. So I get to Harlem United. I'm all gassed up. I got this nice title, director of business development, only to be let go a month and a half in. Mm. Now, what am I going to say to the folks that I used to work for at, at Greater Bergen when they check in on me and see how I'm doing or like I'm trying to figure out how to make some get some work? I didn't know what to say. I, I was I was definitely in a moment of crisis trying to figure out what do I do? Where do I go from here? Because the track that I was on, I don't think is possible anymore. I can't lead a nonprofit after this moment. Like, what, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And all I could think of was I got to find something with the, I guess maybe start with the title again, something that looks looks cool. And so I became an inside sales executive for three months. Uh, I knew I didn't want to go outside again. Um, I like to be, I like to be in. Um, but uh, I was there for about what, three months at ZocDoc. Great service. Um, just wasn't for me. It was uh, heavy phone sales. And I was sitting there wondering what the heck, what am I doing? What, like, what am I doing here? This is not, it's not where I see myself being. Um mm-hmm. And so I, I quit that job because I was so stressed out. I just wasn't great with over the phone sales. I was calling to places like, you know, the, the far northwest corners of Maryland and talking to doctors who maybe just got a fax machine, you know, about an app uh, where they could book appointments. Right. Um, yeah, I so I, I just was like, I can't I'm not connecting with this. I need something more mission aligned. I need something more values based for me. It wasn't it. Mm-hmm. What they set out to do as a mission to make healthcare access more accessible by way of technology, I think that's phenomenal. I just I, I would have let myself go. I was poor, performing for, poorly, and so I said, "I'm leaving." And they asked me what I want to do. I'm going to be an actor. 
because uh, <laughs> I had yeah. I had friend, uh, a couple friends at the time. One at the time was an opera singer, still sings opera. We see him at the Met uh, fall winter season or in Vienna, where his uh, home opera house is. And I had another friend who was uh, doing film and TV. You no, know, like you should give this a shot, man. You got personality for it, blah blah blah. Plus, I'm gonna do this. Um, and so I started acting and just going to open calls because I could sing. I said, I'm going to show up to these open calls and just sing stuff. And maybe I'll get a job like singing background for some show on Broadway and nobody knows who I am. But I'll make twelve hundred dollars a week to sing. And that'll be cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a moment for me where I was just like completely off my beaten path. I was just in the wind until Fountain House kind of put me back um, on, on that path. That's where I needed to be. And so for me, again, it was just that determination, right? Going back to, um, you know, that eighth grade prediction, but really leaning in that and just saying, look, whatever's going to happen is going to work out. Just just focus on what's in front of you and, and do what you got to do to meet your obligations, your bills and all that. And I was lucky to have, you know, my mom, God rest her soul. Uh, you know, my mom at the time was very supportive of me and helping me out with all those things. Um, but yeah, I did ZocDoc. I was acting. I did Postmates for like two days. I got hit by a car, like trying to be like Robin Thicke. Remember the first Robin Thicke music video? He had the long hair with no shirt and he's like riding through New York City and he's da 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 da. He's like doing his thing. And that was me. I was in a flow. It was end of day two, toward the end of day two. And I'm like, I got this. And I'm mm-hmm. coming down with my little backpack, turn the curb. And I got skipped like a rock. You would have thought Thanos was real and picked me up and just skipped me down Second Avenue, like uh, about 30 feet. And that's when I said, I'm done with that. So I, I was all over. I was doing all these things. And, and I think for me, in terms of just how you mm-hmm. get over over that ad- adversity mm-hmm. and how you got out of it on the other side, I think sometimes it's just sheer will. That's that makes it. sense. I appreciate that. And I think that's that's very, uh, I appreciate the vulnerability to show that it's not all linear, right? And we don't have this one LinkedIn path that just looks like everything's always been peachy because um, that's just yeah. not real. So I appreciate that. Okay, I know we've learned a lot about you today from getting hit by a car to <laughs> to being a singer to yeah. working in different industries, in different spaces. Um, we didn't talk about uh, things like you have a master's, you're a professor, um, all of these continued things that, you know, are just completely make Ian the whole person. Um, is there anything we have not discussed today that the world should know about Ian? You know, I feel like we hit on a lot. I think for me, like, at the end of the day, you know, for as put together whatever as I may be, I'm a I'm a big old man child at heart. I, I really I really try to enjoy, you know, every moment, especially, you know, when I'm having my downtime. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm really intense uh and focused at work, right? Um and we you know, some some people they work in construction, it's more physical. That's not the case for me. It's it's mental, it's up here. And so I'm I'm for me, the one thing I'll say that I want people to know is you know, I, I'm just big on huge work-life balance and enabling success. So mm. yeah, really passionately going after the things that you want, you know, just unabashedly, without shame, protecting those things that are very important to you, you know, such as, you know, that work-life balance and that time you have to be able to recover and refresh, to show up strong for what you need, but also being mission, mission-driven, mission you know, how, how can you be, how can you do something that is, you know, in, in service to others? And the community around you, you know, I feel like maybe that was her today, but, you know, that was the biggest thing. Otherwise, I would have said singing because uh, most people I work with do not know that about me. I love that. No, that's awesome. Yeah. I think. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for. Oh, wait, wait. I got I got one. I got one thing, even though I don't know if he's watching, but I'll tell I'll tell him to watch. Jay Book from B2K. I outdrank him. <laughs> <laughs> Where he's a great guy. guy. He's a great guy. Uh, he was actually in a play, uh, Man of the House, that that I'm in. It's the only play that I do. Um, mm-hmm. They are all like family to me. Awesome. And and um, we brought in a number of different guest stars, including Willie Teller from Day 26, Chris Williams, uh, if you're a big R&B head, you know, um, so don't wake me, I'm dreaming. Chris King, who's now in the cast, uh, he people might know him from Wildin' Out or his viral YouTube impressions. I know, him, I know him as the guy that went to high school with me. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I know we got a mutual friend there. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. and he's great. He's great, and all these folks, you know, we're that's what we're about. You know, whether that. you're get, whether you're famous or whether you know you're me or one of the other cast members in, in the show, and and that's why I stay around it because it's we we're 
we're we all walk with the energy of how can we make the world better around us. And I, I think on this evening in particular in West Orange, New Jersey, I, I made Jay Book better, a better person. Uh, he he went back to California, and I'm sure that he's practiced how to you know drink a little, drink one or two more drinks more more than I more than I can. And I, I take pride in knowing that I I had a great time getting to uh, to commiserate with uh, a boy band and uh, early 2000s R and B pop superstar. So Absolutely. yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's great, man. You're you're amongst the legends. I appreciate that. No, I'm not. Don't gas me up, man. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and believe on the mission we're on, please like, rate, and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're using and share this podcast with your friends and your networks. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at Career Cheat Code and tell us people or careers you would like to see highlighted. See you next week with some more cheat codes. Peace.